Okay, we can get started now. My name is George Maeda. Uh, I will be the moderator of this uh, two hour meeting. Um, unfortunately, we have a change in, in the agenda. Uh, the Nobel laureate, um, Professor D.D. Quellos, um, had an emergent, emergency in the family, therefore is not able to uh, talk to us today. However, we have Dr. Ooishi of the Nastro National Astronautic Reserve in Japan, who will give a lecture today about, entitled, The Beautiful Skies for All. So let me roughly go through the agenda. We start off with uh, welcome and uh, opening remarks by uh, Professor Nakasuka, University of Tokyo. He will do that for about 10 minutes. And then from 10.10 to 10.50, we'll have the, the presentation by uh, Dr. Oishi of, um, let's see, I think it's Kokuritsu uh, Tenbondai in Japanese. We have a group photo session at 10.50. And then for about one hour, we'll have a breakout session. It will be conducted by Nate Taylor as usual. That should end up uh, in around 10.45, and then we'll have the last 15 minutes for announcements and uh, closing remarks. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Nakasuka. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you very much. So I'd like to share the screen. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to the 14th UNICEF Global Virtual Meeting. My name is Shinji Nakasuka, University of Tokyo. I'd like to give a very brief opening remarks. So today's main theme is Rose to Dark Sky. So let's, let us talk about entropy and its relationship with global issues. So this theme is very important and the, I have been, uh, you know, uh, contemplating on this matter uh, recently. So let me share uh, my thought. Maybe as you know, entropy has been uh, defined in the thermodynamics, statis statistics, information theory, and so on. And the definition is a little different from this field, but it is related to the number of possible states, which indicate the level of randomness, unpredictability, uselessness, and so on. And maybe as you know, famous second law of thermodynamics tell that entropy of isolated or closed system cannot decrease with time. That means equal or increase. And they always arrive at the state of thermodynamic equilibrium where the entropy is highest. So let me show the simple example. A fossil fuel, uh, oil, coal, natural gas is very, very low entropy, but uh, we are generating the, this kind of the higher entropy. And from the forest, we, develop, uh, we make some chips and which is burned out. And so this also generate, you know, a lot of entropy. Structured, well-organized, known, separated, two, unstructured, uh, uniform, clutter, messy, unknown, uncertain, mix. This is the direction of the natural phenomena. And the living animal or plants has a very low entropy, but the dead animal plants are very high entropy. So this red arrow is irreversible. So we cannot change the direction. So that is a, a second row. Total entropy always increase. That is uh, told in the second row of thermodynamics. Let me show some example. Recycling of a paper. In local perspective, it seems to reduce entropy, but uh, input of large energy is required, which generate other, a lot of waste. So in total, uh, in larger perspective, this action increases entropy. Let me consider a nation. Sometimes internal entropy of a nation gets higher. That means the increase of uh, jobless rate, lack of food, political uneasiness, diseases, and so on. In that case, maybe the politician of this nation want to reduce this entropy. That is to throw away entropy to surrounding countries. Then temporarily entropy, internal entropy gets lower. So. What kind of action do they take? So the most effective way or most quick way is to use, for example, the war. So war is action to throw away entropy to surrounding countries. 
And of course, in larger perspective, total entropy definitely decreases. Uh, sorry, increases. So let me show the simple, as an example of the outcome of increase of entropy. If a person gets angry, maybe his or her internal entropy gets higher. Then he or she may want to throw away his entropy, his entropy and that is a get angry with other people or, you know, a scold other persons. Then temporarily entropy decreases, but on the other hand, this person's entropy increases. So total entropy increases, and sometimes this person throw away his entropy to surrounding person. So this kind of the, you know, process will be iterated. A man or a person grow up. Growth means uh, more structured or knowledgeable. That means entropy decrease. But uh, the uh, second row tell that total entropy increases. Then how come uh, of the, you know, this kind of the entropy? Yes. So the people uh, throw away large entropy while growing up. And the, what is that? For example, consumption of food energy or sometimes the children uh, break something or make a mess to surroundings. So this kind of the process is very important to reduce internal entropy. And we have many, many global issues which can be interpreted as entropy crisis, like a global warming, air pollution, microplastics, space debris, and so on. So I think I know entropy crisis is very, very difficult problem. Let me uh, discuss about entropy and human being. So in order to discuss this, we'd like to incorporate the notion of information theoretic entropy. In information theory, if you get to know something, entropy decreases because unpredictability decreases. Man grows by taking negative entropy, sometimes called the negentropy, from food and water to structured body. This is more like a thermodynamic type of the entropy and to get the knowledge to increase prediction capability. And the, as I said, uh, in order to decrease entropy, human system is made open and throws away generated entropy to the surroundings. This is my, I, something like a hypothesis. Human being is very sensitive to the increase of internal or external entropy. And, and entropy increasing environment makes man nervous uneasy and the desire to escape from this current situation. Curiosity can be considered the desire to reduce internal entropy. For example, in some islands in Pacific Ocean, some people disappear, disappear on ships every year, even though there is enough food on islands. Okay, so this may be coming from a curiosity or the desire to reduce internal entropy. And so in that sense, human being intuitively uh, desires to go to space because he wants to reduce internal entropy or as en entropy gets larger. Finally, I'd like to discuss how to mitigate as entropy increase. So as I said, uh, entropy increase uh, make a big you know, problem, big issues on the earth. The second law, tells that any activity to reduce entropy, uh, sorry, uh, reduce entropy generates additional entropy and the total entropy increase will be larger than the case, nothing is done. So the best thing is we do, we do nothing, but that cannot be done. And the second rule of thermodynamics tell that entropy of isolated or closed system cannot decrease with time. But pre this isolated or closed part is very, very important. So if we make it an open system, so this second row of some dynamic does not, you know, uh, cannot be applied. So we can change the system differently. Actually, the earth system is already open. Uh, for example, sunlight is coming into the earth. So large energy is coming into the earth. But it is very low entropy because the sun, uh, you know, temperature is very high. Low entropy, uh, large energy is coming into. How about, uh, you know, uh, emission from the Earth? Uh, radiation in the space is like this. High entropy, like a just value is emitting from the Earth. And the, it is very interesting. Human-oriented entropy is just a 0.02% of this emitted entropy. What is the other? 
The other is, you know, heat generated from sunlight. So one way is to utilize more solar energy. So that is one direction of the solving the problems. The another direction is to make more open uh, earth uh, with this space. That means that we should encourage more exchange of energy, substances, and information uh, with the space. I think this is a very important objective of space exploration. Space activities objective uh, is to accelerate more exchange between Earth and the space in order to reduce entropy inside the Earth. So this is my conclusion up to now. So thank you very much, and the, please enjoy tonight's talk. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Nakasuka, thank you for the opening remarks. Uh, without further ado, let's go on to the um, main speaker, Dr. Masatoshi Oishi of National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. The title of his talk is The Beautiful Skies for All. So, um, Oishi Sensei, you now have the floor. Uh, Maeda-san, thank you very much for introducing me. And uh, before uh, starting my talk, I would like to share uh, that uh, uh, many of you uh, feel regret. Uh, so we don't have uh, Didier Kelo uh, tonight. Uh, I will do my best to uh, talk uh, for him but uh, the content is my own one. So I will share. Um, uh, this one, yes. Okay. So the, the my, my talk for uh, this evening in, in Japanese time is the beautiful skies uh, for all. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, show you, you this very beautiful uh, night sky uh, taken uh, near the Atacama Desert, uh, South America. So uh, we can see very beautiful uh, Milky Way uh, here. And uh, we can see many, 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 many stars. And we, we can also see that this is the large Magellanic cloud. And here we have the small Magellanic, Magellanic cloud. And uh, here, here we have a lake and we can see a reflection of the large Magellanic cloud here. So it's very beautiful. If we go to the South America or somewhere else with dark, dark sky, we can enjoy uh, such a beautiful uh, skies. So this image was taken uh, inside Japan. Uh, two years ago, I visited the um, Ongasawa Islands uh, and I took my own camera and took this uh, 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 very dark uh, sky uh, image. I think you can guess where this region is. Here, here is the Orion, constellation Orion. So here's the very famous Orion, Orion Nebula. And here uh, we, can, we can see the Pleiades. And uh, you may be able to see um, here this, in this region, um, the Milky Way, the outer part of our Milky Way. And here we can see a uh, winter triangle. This is Sirius and Procyon. So many of you have seen uh, this famous uh, sky region uh, in, in your area. But if you uh, go to uh, somewhere in Japan, we can uh, see uh, this bright sky. 
with Orion here. It's very sad to have such a very bright sky, you know, illuminated, illuminated by city lights. So I took this picture uh, just one year ago uh, in the northern part of the uh, Kanto uh, plain. Uh, so this, uh, this, you know, city lights came from the city of uh, Tokyo. So it's, it's very sad to see such, uh, such very bright uh, skies. Now, um, this uh, image shows uh, how uh, major cities in the world are so bright seen for, from uh, the space. You can, uh, you can see uh, many populated areas such as North America, uh, European major cities, India, uh, Eastern part of China, as well as Japan. So if you live in these areas, it is very hard to uh, see a very beautiful Milky Way, for example. But uh, if, we, if you uh, go a little bit further away from those uh, uh, bright areas, you will still be able to see uh, very dark skies. So this is our you know, current situation. And uh, we, we see the sky with our naked eyes. Our naked eyes can see the so-called you know, uh, visible lights. So in this picture image, um, there are many our Milky Ways. You know, in the middle, uh, we have uh, an image uh, corresponding to the optical uh, wavelength, visible light. So uh, this picture corresponds to the distribution of uh, stars. But these days, uh, astronomers can observe uh, the Milky Way galaxy in a variety of uh, wavelengths. For example, at the top, uh, we can see a very um, low uh, frequency radio uh, wavelength at uh, 1.4 gigahertz. The, its wavelength is 21 centimeter. This, uh, uh, this is a distribution of atomic hydrogen along the uh, galactic uh, plane. The second panel corresponds to molecular hydrogen you now seen in the near infrared at around two, uh, uh, two uh, micrometers. So this uh, you know, molecular hydrogen uh, corresponds to denser region uh, among the Milky Way galaxy. In the infrared, you know, middle or uh, uh, far infrared regions, uh, we can see the distribution of uh, small particles, so-called the cosmic dust. And near infrared, we can, we can also see the distribution of uh, uh, red giants and such low temperature stars. On the other hand, uh, we can see very, very different views in X-rays and gamma rays, which corresponds to very high temperature regions corresponding to high supernovae remnants and, and others. So these days, uh, astronomers, in astronomy, we can uh, see a variety of uh, Milky Ways. So ra radio astronomy has been uh, uh, very useful in, in investi investigating our universe. Uh, this is one of his examples. We, if we use the uh, uh, emission line of uh, uh, neutral hydrogen at uh, 1.4 gigahertz at uh, 21 centimeters, we are able to uh, draw the distribution of <clears throat> Uh, gas rotating around the galactic center here. Uh, we are located here, and this is the sun, our sun. And uh, uh, by using the uh, uh, atomic hydrogen uh, emission line, uh, we are able to see, to understand that uh, our uh, Milky Way galaxy is, uh, is a spiral uh, galaxy. 
This was possible because uh, radio waves are not uh, absorbed by um, intergalactic or galactic medium. Whereas um, <clears throat> optical waves are uh, absorbed by uh, small particles, uh, so-called cosmic dust, and it is impossible, almost impossible, to, to draw uh, such uh, you know, uh, distribution of our uh, Milky Way galaxy. So these days, it is very crucial to uh, combine a variety of wavelengths in order to uh, get better understanding of our universe in astronomy. So <clears throat> as I said, uh, we astronomers use many um, uh, wavelengths uh, spanning from gamma rays, gamma rays to radio wavelengths. Uh, from the ground-based uh, telescopes, uh, we are able to use the optical wavelengths and near-infrared, as well as radio uh, wavelengths only. Now, this is because the, the atmosphere absorbs, for example, gamma ray, x-ray, ultraviolet, and uh, middle and far-infrared regions. For those uh, uh, wavelength regions, we have to launch, for example, uh, uh, airplane to the uh, stratosphere, or we need to launch satellites uh, to observe you know, those uh, freak, uh, uh, wavelength regions. So uh, we astronomers utilize not only uh, ground-based uh, telescopes, but also uh, satellites. So we, we have been uh, 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 enjoying the benefit from satellite technologies. So uh, this is one of the example of uh, what we have uh, obtained by using uh, satellite observations. Uh, <clears throat> this was given by the Planck uh, satellite, uh, by the Planck mission uh, collaborations. Uh, to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation in the whole uh, universe. I would like you to uh, see that, you know, this is uh, uh, shown in a temperature scale. So here, here is a scale and uh, the unit is micro Kelvin. So these, these um, radio emissions are very, very weak, but the current uh, technologies have enabled uh, astronomers to measure such very, very weak and the tiny, tiny uh, variations of radiations. And by an analyzing uh, those uh, distributions, radiation distributions, now we are able to derive the uh, uh, age of the universe to be 13.8 billion years. And the constituents of our universe. For example, uh, the ordinary matter that is us, you know, there are 92 uh, natural elements and other uh, artificial elements. They consist of uh, so-called baryons. Such ordinary matter occupies only 4.9% of the universe. 27% corresponds to this, the dark matter. And uh, the rest, 68.5%. 3% is uh, corresponding to the so-called dark energy. So when I saw this report for the first time, I was shocked to know that uh, we know a small portion only. It was very sad. Before that, we thought, you know, astronomers knew almost all of the universe, but we were wrong. We have to study uh, many, many new uh, uh, issues. 
So um, astronomers have developed, you know, uh, very sensitive telescopes, instruments, and others. But these days, uh, satellite technology is advanced, and it is now possible to launch the so-called uh, mega constellations. The very, very famous one is uh, Starlink uh, constellation. They are going to launch, uh, uh, according to them, uh, 42,000 uh, satellites in the future. But currently, they have about you know, 3,000 satellites in orbit. The first launch of the Starlight uh, Starlink uh, constellation started two years ago. And uh, as soon as uh, the Starlight uh, Starlink launch was made, uh, astronomers happened to observe uh, such um, trails of uh, satellites. The astronomers were very shocked. Uh, this is because, you know, the, the, the satellites, uh, uh, the orbital height uh, altitudes are about, you know, 500 to uh, 1,000 uh, kilometers. So uh, they move very, very fast. So we, we usually use, you know, uh, optical telescopes with exposure time of 10 to 20 uh, seconds or something. So satellites are seen uh, with such uh, trails. So these trails will impair uh, astronomical observations uh, in the optical and infrared, as well as the radio regions. So uh, we, we had to uh, talk with the SpaceX people. They are very friendly. And we have been talking with them to uh, mitigate uh, such uh, uh, satellite uh, trails for our better future. But before uh, mitigating uh, these satellite uh, trails, we have to measure how bright they are. So uh, uh, several astronomical groups made uh, measurements, including us. So as I said, uh, for example, uh, Starlink uh, orbits uh, around you know, 500, uh, 550 kilometers above the sea level. So a single satellite moves very, very fast, about uh, 2,000 arc seconds per second of time. So it's very fast. So uh, the, uh, usually, you know, uh, astronomical telescopes cannot uh, trace, track uh, such fast-moving uh, objects. So uh, we decided to fix, uh, uh, point the telescope towards a fixed position through uh, accurate position uh, uh, predictions. So uh, this is one of the example of satellite uh, trail by, uh, through such uh, uh, observing uh, mode. So uh, through, oh, excuse me, Something was, yeah, this, this is uh, one, one of uh, statics, statistics. Um, this picture uh, figure corresponds to the distribution of uh, visual uh, magnitudes uh, corresponding to uh, var various uh, satellite numbers. Uh, astronomical uh, magnitudes. Uh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with astronomical magnitudes. Uh, Small numbers corresponds to brighter uh, stars, and uh, large uh, magnitudes corresponds to darker. So, and uh, uh, we usually say that uh, uh, we can see uh, stars in the very dark uh, areas down to uh, magnitude six. So this is the limit uh, by naked eyes. So uh, you can easily uh, see that uh, the Starlink satellites can be seen by your uh, naked eyes. Uh, the brightest one has uh, magnitude two, which is which corresponds to the brightness of uh, uh, Vega or something. So these, these are very bright. So we need to mitigate 
uh, such bright uh, satellites. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, reduce reduce the brightness, not uh, shooting the star uh, the satellites. So um, this was made uh, at a single uh, band uh, about green uh, wavelength. Uh, if we uh, use multiple uh, bands uh, in a single telescope, we are able to derive, uh, uh, for example, temperature, uh, surface temperature, or uh, and uh, uh, reflectivity of the surface of those uh, satellites. So this is this is one of exam example uh, made uh, by our group. The right-hand panel corresponds to the uh, untreated uh, Starlink satellite number 1113, uh, measured uh, one and a half years ago. So we used three uh, bands uh, corresponding to uh, visual and infrared region. And uh, this is the best fit curve corresponding to this uh, uh, satellite. And we uh, derived the reflectivity of about seven and a half percent. Starlink, as I said, a star, a SpaceX company is friendly to us and uh, they try to reduce the brightness of their satellites. And they uh, launched an exper experimental satellite, so-called DarkSat, which is coated with uh, reducing uh, 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 coating. We, we also measured the brightness of the dark set and derived the uh, reflectivity of 4%. So uh, it, it is good, it is good that uh, uh, SpaceX technologies worked uh, well, but uh, this is not sufficient uh, for us. So we talked to uh, SpaceX people and uh, they realized the problem and they tried to introduce another uh, way to reduce the reflectivity. This is a so-called visor set. So they uh, installed, you know, sun visors, you know, uh, on 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 the satellites, which will uh, hide the sunlight. So uh, the the idea was to uh, reduce the uh, reflection light uh, by the satellite. So the right panel uh, corresponds to the actual measurements on uh, uh, visor set. The original Starlink satellite uh, brightness distribution corresponds to the dotted lines, histograms. So the mean value is around you know, uh, four, four, five and uh, five magnitude. For visor set, the uh, median value is around six and a half. So this is comparable with the uh, reduction of uh, uh, dark set, which is not sufficient. So uh, people have been struggling how to re reduce, you know, a satellite brightness, but this is not yet solved. So uh, I, I would like to summarize um, <clears throat> the issues uh, in the optical wavelengths. Uh, satellites are still still too bright. Uh, they are almost uh, brighter than seven magnitudes. So uh, we need to develop new technologies uh, to further reduce brightness. This is a new engineering problems. And another one is that uh, there is no international organization for regulating satellite brightness, total number of satellites. This, this corresponds to avoidance of a collision you know, in order to reduce, you know, space debris and others. So uh, people have to uh, uh, establish such uh, international organization or uh, establish a uh, uh, dedicated division in, a, uh, in an existing international organization toward uh, regulating uh, sat satellite brightness and others uh, as an uh, urgent issue. Well, what she says, a quick question. Yeah. So this visor is fairly effective? Uh, yes, a bit, yes. 
What about cost performance? If, it, if it's too expensive, SpaceX won't do it, right? I have no answer. <laughs> we have to ask, you know, the space, SpaceX uh, 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 technicians how much it, it, it costs. Or uh, we could uh, directly ask, you know, Elon Musk how much uh, you have invested uh, <laughs> to reduce, uh, to uh, develop uh, Pfizer set. I see. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So now um, I'm going to uh, switch the topic into radio. So um, uh, radio astronomy uh, also uh, experience uh, radio interference. This is an image uh, taken by the uh, la uh, very large arrays located in uh, New Mexico uh, in the Uni United States. Uh, <clears throat> the left panel, corresponds to uh, a radio image uh, toward a star without radio interference. But uh, when the VLA, VLA guys uh, observed the same star, when a satellite uh, flew 25 degrees away from the star, they experienced very strong interference. And uh, it is impossible to see the star at all. This is one of an uh, example of interference, radio interference. Radio signals from the celestial bodies are so, so weak. This is a, a, a diagram showing how weak uh, celestial cosmic radio sources are. Um, here we have a curve corresponding to the active sun. When the sun explosion, uh, solar flares occurs, uh, they emit very strong radio waves. The here, here corresponds to galactic uh, background radiation. And uh, here we have Jupiter. Jupiter, because you know Jupiter has a magnetic uh, field, uh, it emits uh, radio waves. The, it's much, much weaker. This, the uh, ordinate corresponds to the uh, logarith logarithmic scale. So Jupiter emission is say uh, 10 to the 10th or 10 to the seventh uh, weaker than the galactic uh, background radiations. So here we can see a curve corresponding to the threshold for the radio astronomy observations defined by the International uh, Telecommunication Union, which I will show uh, later. This curve is not sufficient to protect uh, radio uh, signals from ordinary uh, stars, but uh, this was established uh, through a uh, uh, compromise by other radio users. So we have been surviving with these uh, insufficient uh, limit. And the radio astronomers want to observe at all frequency range, of course because the radio star, radio uh, objects emit at all frequency range. Similarly, other radio users may want to emit at all frequency range because you know, radio waves now uh, you are used for uh, a business such as mobile phones, televisions, and others. This is very important for our life. Therefore, all radio users, including radio astronomers, have to share this frequency resource. The resource is a limited one. So we have to coordinate among us. This uh, is because- Professor yes. Oishi, you, yeah. you, have, you have nine minutes left. Okay, yes, I know. So uh, in the radio region, we have an international coordination uh, organization the largest one is the so-called International Telecommunication Union, uh, located in Geneva. 
as I said, uh, the ITU has established the protection, pro pro protection criteria for radio astronomical observations uh, since 60 uh, years ago. And there are other regional bodies and uh, in, for national issues are governed by each uh, uh, government. For the case of Japan, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication uh, defines its own radio law, and everybody has to uh, follow this uh, radio law within Japan. But unfortunately, um, the radio astronomers are eligible to uh, claim protection in a small portions only. So yellow part, green parts, uh, blue, uh, cyan and and and, and the, this these areas, we are able to claim protection. This is, this is very small portions only. But we have to survive with these you know, international regulations. Uh, in the past, uh, radio users, you know, they transmit radio waves. Uh, primarily in a lower frequency regions, uh, such as below 10 gigahertz, its wavelength is 30 centimeters, uh, three centimeters, excuse me. But the recent advancement of technologies have allowed radio users to use higher frequency regions, such as three millimeter wave band, where radio astronomies have discovered many molecules and others, and these days, uh, people are able to uh, transmit up to 450 gigahertz for short range use. So we have to survive with uh, such a new environment. This is an example of uh, uh, emission from car radar, which is useful for preventing um, car uh, collisions. But uh, its operational uh, frequency is 76 gigahertz. We made uh, this measurement by using the Nobuyama 45 meter telescope. Uh, we, we, we drove the car with the radar at a distance of 500 meters and which was observed in a very, very strong, as a very, very strong signal. So based on this uh, measurement, we, we knew that uh, uh, the radio uh, car radars must be separated beyond 135 kilometers. This is very difficult to manage. So uh, National Astronomical Observatory of Japan uh, established the Spectrum Management uh, Office uh, for radio astronomy, as well as the optical wavelength two years ago, where uh, I am the head of this uh, office. So uh, uh, our office is a unified gateway to the international and the national coordination so if you are interested in, uh, in our activity, please visit uh, this website. Uh, but uh, this is mostly in Japanese at present and the English version is, is under construction. Partially it is uh, uh, available. So uh, one example is the coordination with Starlink. Starlink downlink satellite to earth direction uses the frequency range between 10.7 to 12.7 gigahertz, which will cause a serious radio frequency interference to the radio astronomy band between 10.6 to 10.7 gigahertz. So after a serious coordination, a SpaceX agreed to suspend the channel, the adjacent channel, 10.7 to 10.95 gigahertz, when a satellite is seen from a radio observatory. This coordination has been made globally. So uh, we have to uh, uh, mitigate radio frequency interference by combining a variety of methodologies, not only regulatory methods, but uh, technological methods. Because I don't have much time, so uh, I would like to uh, uh, go very fast. <clears throat> Uh, for astronomers, we need to select a site as radio quiet as possible. This is our, this is our duty. So such 
uh, regions are called radio quiet zones. Radio quiet zones would work for ground-based radio frequency interference in interference sources, but would not work for uh, radio frequency, frequency emissions from airplanes, satellites, balloons, and high altitude platform stations. This is very serious. Other than that, uh, we have to develop uh, mitigation techniques such as RFI excision, cutting out uh, filters, blocking data and others, RFI cancellations and others. So uh, uh, this is one example made uh, by the Australian uh, people. Uh, this, is, uh, th th this image was taken with interference, but after uh, applying the RFI uh, removal uh, technology, it is possible to see a hint of uh, radio sources, but uh, this is not perfect. So finally, I'd like to say that uh, our sky is a shared natural uh, resource. <clears throat> Uh, here is an article 196 uh, in the ITU Constitution and Convention. In using frequency bands for radio services, members, this means government, shall bear in mind that radio frequencies and any associate orbits, including the geostationary satellite orbit, are limited natural resources and that they must be used nationally, efficiently, economically, in conformity with these provisions of the radio regulations. So uh, we have to know that uh, there are problems to be fixed. Toward that direction, first of all, we need to respect to each other. And I strongly believe that the new ideas for solving the problems through technological advancement would be needed. And I think we are able to do that. It may take time, but we can do that. Toward that direction, dialogues and discussion would be needed. And it takes time and we have to be patient for our better common future. Okay, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Oich Sensei, thank you for a very fascinating presentation. We have some time for question. If you have a question, please go ahead. We have a lot of people tonight, 52 people. Mm. Somebody must have a question. Can I ask a question? This is Ji Xin Zhuang from Taiwan. Go ahead. Yeah, I thank you for the presentation. It's very nice, but I think I'm talking about the SpaceX case because, uh, for example, satellite trajectory can be predicted. Can we design telescope to by considering this effect and mitigate accordingly? What do we think about this? Um, that's one possibility. Uh, if the number of satellites are so small. But uh, as of today, there are more than 3,000 satellites. So it would be very uh, difficult to avoid all of them, especially when astronomers use wide field cameras with the field of view of uh, two, three degrees. But okay. for in inf infrared uh, observations, the field of view is much smaller. So if we are able to predict, you know, precise and accurate satellite positions, it would be possible to avoid such um, uh, satellite trails. Thank you. Okay, so there's a question from Midori-san. Midori-san, go ahead. Um, first, Dr. Oshishi, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. Um, I'm just a dumb high schooler listening in from Malaysia, but I would like to ask a really dumb question. Um, I thought the paint Banta Black was actually manufactured and tested to be used in space for um, satellite communication to be made less 
reflective, but at the current moment, is Vanta Black too expensive to be used for a lot of the satellites mm. about to be now? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that's true. That this is why I said that we need to develop, you know, new technologies with uh, reasonable, reasonable price. So everybody has to uh, uh, has a, it, it's it's too not too much, uh, you know. I think this is a uh, new uh, engineering uh, issue. So uh, if we are able to uh, develop such um, uh, wonderful um, coating with reasonable price, everybody will be happy. We can uh, save a lot of money and uh, it's very uh, cost performance, good uh, cost performance. All right, we can take one more question. So uh, Oichi Sensei, can you look at your chat? There's a question chat? from Lawrence, uh -huh. Lawrence Reeves. Uh, excuse me. Sorry, I, I think I only sent that to you, George. Um, now, my question is, how feasible is it um, and, and how effective would it be to be able to conduct radio astronomy from orbit? Um, you know, the, the size of the um, radio antennas that you need to do your research, how, um, how feasible would it be to put a radio antenna like that in orbit above the satellites in order to be able to um, conduct the, the astronomy? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we uh, radio astronomy community uh, have already launched several um, radio telescopes orbiting in, in, in orbit. But uh, it is, you know, we have to have very um, good surface accuracy, uh, less than, uh, for example, uh, 100 micrometers RMS, uh, in order to uh, conduct uh, high frequency uh, observations. At the present, uh, with the current uh, technologies, it is quite difficult to achieve such very good surface accuracy. So uh, it, it, it may take um, 10, 20, 30 years from now, but uh, this is not an easy solution uh, in the near future. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you once again, uh, Oishi Sensei for your fine presentation. We, we move on to the next uh, segment of the meeting. This is where uh, Nate Taylor takes over. Nate, take it away. Oh, thank you, George. And uh, thank you, Kawashima san. If, uh, if, if any of you weren't smiling after that, I don't know how, uh, because every single time that you do that, I cannot help but smile. <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's gorgeous. Um, so uh, thank you to Oishi Sensei uh, and Akasuka Sensei uh, for your presentations. Uh, that was interesting. I think it's given us some good background on the issue. Um, and before we get into the breakout sessions, the series, evening i actually just wanted to quickly launch a little poll it's very simple so it should be coming up on your screen now um which is just asking were you aware of the lost dark sky problem before the meeting today so yes no or i had heard about it but i don't know much um and this is just so you know uh, we can get a little bit of an idea as to you know how much information you had prior to going into this meeting and i think uh wishy sensei in particular he was interested um in in knowing this so if you could just take a moment, I see 18 people have filled it out. So if you haven't filled it out, I'll just give you a minute to, to do that. That'd be great. Hey, Nate, wait, what, what do we do here? Oh, so um, it should just come up with a little uh, pop up on your screen, um, which should just ask you to answer this question. Um, and you can just select one of the answers and hit submit. So we've got about 65% of people have answered. That's, that's, that, that's pretty good, that's pretty decent. Um, I will 
share the results with you all. Oh. I hope you can see the results there. I clicked share. I'm not sure if you can. Uh, the polling uh, uh, system in Zoom doesn't always work as we want it to. Uh, but there were about 48% who said that, yes, they, they were aware. Um, and 40% who said, I'd heard about it, but didn't know much. 12% said no. So thank you very much uh, for taking the time to fill that out. So uh, look, if you haven't joined us for a, a Unisec Global Virtual Meeting before, this part of the virtual meeting is where we come together and uh, we discuss uh, so the, the topic, the theme for the evening, or we might complete an activity. And we do that by splitting the group into smaller groups um, in uh, breakout groups. Um, and so tonight, uh, what we're doing is I've actually got an activity, which I'll just share for you now. Just bear with me. There we go. So you should be able to see uh, up on your screen the activity that we're going to complete. So we'll have about 35 minutes. I'll split you up into smaller groups. Uh, and you've only really got one task. And the task is to choose one of the following questions uh, and discuss it in your group. Um, if you do finish this question ahead of time, I encourage you to, to go through and answer the other uh, subsequent questions as well. But the first one is about uh, responsibility for preserving the dark night sky. So it's, it's more about, you know, governing bodies. So who would be responsible for pre preserving the dark night sky and what can each group or segment do about it? So you can think about more than one group and I've just listed some um, examples there of different groups. Um, and then you could think about what each group might be able to do about preserving the dark night sky. And the second question is about uh, launching things because obviously the number of launches that we've had uh, in recent years has increased exponentially. It doesn't look like it is slowing down. And so, uh, you know, obviously satellites are contributing to the loss of the dark night sky, but as is uh, orbital debris um, and uh, all of the other things that we have in orbit, like rocket bodies. So this is about asking whether we should limit the number of new launches. And then if yes, um, you know, talking about how we can do that, or if no, uh, why not? And what else can be done? Um, the third question is uh, about technology. So for, for those of you who are more tech minded, what type of technologies could we use uh, to improve the current situation and preserve the dark night sky for all of us? And these could be either existing technologies which are you know, emerging, or may have been demonstrated, um, or they could be things that you could see as might be new innovative technologies. So I hope that's clear. What we'll do is once uh, you're in the breakout rooms as well, by the way, I will broadcast a message to you, which has all of these questions. Uh, so don't worry, uh, you won't go in there without those questions, I'll send them through to you. Um, but I might just stop sharing my screen now. And before I open up the breakout session, I just want to ask if there's any uh, anyone who has uh, questions and would like anything clarified. Nope. Okay, oh, excellent. Nate? I'll, yes. Uh, the, uh, the second question the, yes. the, is it the, the limited number of uh, the, the satellites, new satellites, or the, the rocket? Ah, it's launches, specifically launches. launches. Yeah, specifically launches. Uh, because we still have to deal with things like rocket bodies in space, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if we're not using reusable rockets, and let's face it, not a, mo most of them aren't. Um, then we still have to deal with things like stage separation of rocket bodies. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, launches in specific. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't matter the big or small rocket. No, nope. nope. doesn't matter if it's a big or small rocket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, I'm going to open up the breakout rooms now. Uh, you have, I've actually changed the time down to 30 minutes just to make sure we're on time. And um, when we do come back from the breakout room, uh, I'll invite you in your groups to share your discussion. So please make sure that you nominate a person who can speak on your behalf from your group, uh, who can share your discussion with the rest of us. All right. I'm going to open up the rooms and we'll see you back here in 30 minutes.
thank you to everybody uh, for participating in the breakout room session. I hope you enjoyed that subject. Um, we have run out of time, but I'm going to put a link in the chat uh, where you can actually look at doing a little bit more reading if you are interested in this subject. There's also some citizen science projects that you can get involved uh, with. There's one called Globe at Night, uh, which I'll put a link in the chat for as well. Um, and it seems like a bit, little bit of a summary from the activity is that um, it was a shared responsibility. Uh, it was quite split in regards to, um, you know, uh, whether we should limit the number of launches or whether we shouldn't. And we spoke about some of the issues surrounding that. Um, and then we had quite a few uh, good suggestions regarding technology, which is currently in use and uh, some innovative solutions as well. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and conversations like this are important to uh, solving these types of issues. Uh, but with that, I will hand it back to George. Uh, Great, to Nate. The rest of the meeting. Thank, Thank you. you, Nate. Uh, thanks for always doing a, a solid job with the uh, breakout sessions. Um, I know it's a difficult task, and so it's much appreciated. All right, we're in the final segment of the 14th virtual Unisec Global meeting. Uh, we have 12 minutes left, and now I turn the floor to uh, Ray Kawashima. Ray, you have the floor. We cannot hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, can you see the slide? Yes. Okay, good. Right. So, so announcement and the new members of the global community. This month, unfortunately, we do not have any new members yet. Uh, maybe next month, or uh, but but we are not greedy, so uh, don't worry. Okay. Um, so the next one is the um, missionary contest. We'll have uh, the final presentation session in the next month. And the new is Tokyo. Uh, however, most of them, most of the participants, and most of reviewers cannot come to Japan. So uh, we will organize it in hybrid way. Um, and the, where most of participants are joined um, through online. And it is the, uh, the, we will broadcast through YouTube. And so we will uh, the, uh, tell you uh, the, the, uh, the URL. So in the, the Mission Rider Contest website. Okay. So, and also the Kibo Cube seventh round application is now open. And the net deadline is the end of this, this year. So if you wanna uh, get a free launch opportunity for one new CubeSat, uh, please uh, take, uh, the, go to the UN USA's uh, web page and the apply. And the, uh, there's the another the opportunity for called JCube, which is special discounted launch opportunities. So almost one third of the, the, the normal price, um, but you need to work with Japanese university. This is um, <laughs> the requirement. Uh, so you need to be patient with Japanese. Um, this is a very tough uh, challenge for you. Um, but if you are interested in it, please uh, contact me. I will forward your request to the uh, a person in charge. In the, uh, the this is uh, the new one. The at APRSOF. APRSOF is the uh, the space agency's forum in Asia Pacific region. Uh, but actually, we the this uh, conference will invite will welcome all of the people from all over the world, from Africa or America. Uh, so you can join, it's free. And this year is the just online conference, a hundred percent online conference. So you can just uh, go to the APR sub web page and the register, then you can, uh, you will get a uh, URL link. And the, the important thing is we, UNICEF, will organize a higher education session. This is a brand new. It's uh, the, this, uh, the conference has a 26 years 
uh, history, but this is the, the very new one. And the, uh, well, this is a great honor for us to be responsible for the higher education session. And now we are seeking the, um, the abstract. You do not need to uh, submit a uh, full paper, just abstract and the, uh, we'll select uh, the maybe six or seven uh, presenters. Um, then you will get a uh, slot for presentation. And this year, uh, we like to get some policies, uh, education policy and or good practice in your country, just uh, uh, contact us. Um, next uh, one is the next month, November 20th, uh, we'll hold the same time, the, the meeting, same time. Um, the, the program is the uh, Deep Space Science Exploration with Nanomicrosatellites again, because the, uh, as I said, November 13th, we'll have the, the final presentation and we'll, we'll, we'll evaluate whose idea is best. So the, we already uh, uh, have uh, some confirmed speakers. Uh, the reviewers of the Mission Idea Contest and Hermann Stein, uh, he's going to make an opening speech. And Professor Yu Funase is uh, uh, the uh, a professor of the University of Tokyo and JAXA. And he's one of the reviewers. So he's going to uh, make uh, some speech about his own experience with deep space science and exploration with nanomicrosatellites. And we do not know who, but mix of winner will be joining as uh, uh, the, and, and uh, we hope that they, they will agree to make a presentation. And, uh, and actually the virtual music global meetings will take place on the third Saturday, almost every month th this year. So the future plan, the IEC study will be held in Dubai in the end of October. Unfortunately, I cannot go, but uh, if you can go, please enjoy. And the seven final presentation is November 13th. And IK's 2021 is in Taiwan in November 11th to 16th. And the African Symposium for Small Satellite will be held in November to December and APR South. And the, uh, this one is also interesting, it could be interesting. The 10th Nanosatellite Symposium in Japan will be held in February. I hope that the um, Japanese government will allow over the foreign the guests uh, to enter in Japan without uh, the two weeks of quarantine. <laughs> So it's very, very tough. And please let us know your even information. If you have, we would like to share with all, all of us. So thank you very much. And the, um, so it's your turn. Uh, if you have any information or announcement, uh, please raise your hand or shout now, now. Anybody have announcement? No. I don't have an announcement, but I have something I just wanted to share with everybody because it was a, a nice little surprise when I received it. So uh, George Maida, our, uh, our lovely moderator, uh, while he was in Haneda Airport, uh, sent me this lovely postcard. Uh, so he actually took time. You probably can't see that because of the glare but he took time out Ooh. of his trip to actually buy this and send it to me. So I thought that was lovely. And I wanted to thank you very much, George, uh, for always being so thoughtful and so generous with your time as well. It is really greatly appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> wow. I never thought it would be shown to a wide audience. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I didn't read out the message. I just showed the picture. So it's, it's okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So... Uh... Uh, is there anybody uh, who wants to say something? Professor Oishi, this is your first time to join our meeting. How was this? <laughs> oh, 
I, I was very happy to see, especially uh, many young and enthusiastic uh, people. I was able to see, you know, bright future. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, so who else wants to talk? Mm. Yoshida-san, do you want to talk something? Well, I, well, thank you very much. Uh, this is a uh, yeah, well, they, um, th thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, Oish-san and uh, um, Nakasuka-san, I, re I really enjoyed the presentation, the entropy and the issue about the uh, dark skies. And th this is a wonderful opportunity. So Kawashima-san and the Tyler-san, the Maeda-san, this is such a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, are there any other Yoshida-san? Oh. Um, I think uh, Dr. Saja had something that he wanted to say. Okay, please go ahead. Uh, well, Professor Toshi already said the same thing, but uh, well, to thank you again. It's very late and uh, you came here to give such wonderful presentations. Very valuable for us. Thank you very much. Okay. Nakasuka Sensei, do you want to say something? Yeah, I already said many things, so it's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay, Cross-san, do you want to say something? Uh, well, I'm going to Dubai next week, so if uh, somebody goes there, so uh, let's see there and have some drink, maybe. <laughs> okay. Wow. Wow. I like your scarf. <laughs> We take, take care of your neck. I need to take off uh, in uh, 40 degrees device. So <laughs> <laughs> I need to get the approval from my doctor next week, maybe. <laughs> okay. So, Ray, I have a comment. Um, yes. So, uh, we have uh, 27 participants right now. Mm -hmm. uh, in the future, when you receive our announcements for this uh, Uniglo meeting, if you want to invite other people, your friends, your colleagues, who, who, who would benefit from this meeting, Please uh, invite them, right? So oh, that we yeah. yes, so we, uh, yes. So we can mm -hmm. so, that, so that we can um, expand the size of our circle. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. And the the email, the initial email that um, either myself or Kawashima San uh, ordinarily send out does have uh, a link for you know the registration of the meeting and i'm pretty sure in that email it says you know if you know somebody who you know you'd like who think you you think would like the meeting to forward the email on to them so yeah please do so mm -hmm. yeah well actually oh uh, it's it's already time so i think uh, i need to say goodbye <laughs> i'm always crying <laughs> when i say goodbye but um I, but the good news is that we will meet next month again. And please join us if you have some time and just some, oh, just a one minute or two minutes is fine. Just uh, come and, and then say hello. Um, and thank you very much for wonderful presentation, Professor Oishi and Professor Nakasuka. And thank you very much for your contribution. It's really, um, good and it's it's really helpful for us to understand the the, the, the nature of the problem it's not a problem but uh, it's, but in, in in my in my perspective it's a problem you know so uh, we need to understand the, the nature of the problem and then and then try not to be selfish and and then try to educate people not to be too selfish and then let's uh, try to find a, a good solution thank you very much and have a nice day and nice um evening and nice sleep and nice dream thank you thank you thank you and see you next month again bye bye, -bye.